Well, good evening, my dear brothers and sisters, young people and friends. It uh, is indeed a pleasure to uh, be with you here this evening. And as our brother Jared said, the title of my topic this evening is What Must I Do to Be Saved? And it, it's really interesting as we go through scriptures and as we, you know, listen to talks and um, how much they are the same. I was thinking about uh, Brother Caleb's talk on Wednesday, and he was doing a talk um, why does the Bible seem sexist? I think that's uh, the way it went. And uh, I just thought it was very interesting how many of the verses he was using in scripture were the verses that I'd also chosen. And, you know, I think one of the main things we have to come to realize is that God is in control, isn't he? Um, and God tells us what we must do. We can't make up our own rules and regulations, and but we have to listen to God. We have to search our scriptures, don't we, to find out what God uh, asks us to do. And so this evening, I thought I would start with my punchline. You know, a lot of times we go through all the verses and we hit you with the punchline right at the end. But uh, tonight, I thought maybe I'd do it a little bit differently and I would give you the punchline right at the beginning. And then you'll sort of know where I'm going and, and what my thoughts are. So. The uh, punchline that I'm using tonight actually comes from one of our forefathers in the Christadelphian faith. It comes from uh, our brother, Robert Roberts. And our brother, Robert Roberts, said that God's plan and, and purpose with this world is not universal salvation, but God manifestation. And so that's really what I'd like to look at this evening. What do we need to do to be saved? Well, God wants us to be like him. So when you look at the word uh, to manifest, it means to bring to light, to make known, to reflect. And so in this kingdom, and we talk about this all the time, don't we? that uh, God is going to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And that, that's God's plan and purpose. And he wants to fill it with people who have the same character as he does. And one of the ways that he wants to bring that about is through the use of his son. And so we know that um, the Lord Jesus Christ was the word made flesh. And so we look at the Lord Jesus Christ and we are commanded to talk like him, to think like him, to act like him. And that that's really um, what it's all about, isn't it? It's reflecting the character of our father in our lives each and every day. And, you know, if we go to Galatians chapter 3, let's just go to Galatians chapter 3. And we look at Galatians chapter 3, and we're looking at verses uh, 26 through to 29. It says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And that's, that's really the secret, isn't it, brothers and sisters, is that if we want to be in God's kingdom, we have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, we're told in John chapter 6, you know, we're commanded to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And he says, you know, that those who eat my flesh and those who drink my blood, my blood are those who live by me, those who put on my name. He goes on to say there, uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promises of God. So 
Uh, there's one of the big commands, isn't there, that we put on the Lord Jesus Christ and we be like him. And, you know, it, it's really interesting. I looked up how many words are found in the King James Bible, and there are 783,137 words in the King James Bible. And of course, this book, this Bible that God has given us, God considers every one of those words essential to salvation. So it's really difficult to, you know, we think of some words that come to mind. We think of grace and absolutely we need God's grace. Uh, we cannot be saved without it. God's favor to man. Um, you know, we, we think of God's mercy. And again, something that we all need. We need God's mercy or faith, something that is required. But, you know, this Bible that we have been given is God's complete uh, commandments or, or set of love letters, as one of my brethren used to say, uh, to us, us from God. And, you know, these things are needful for us if we want to be in God's kingdom. And, of course, you know, we're all familiar with Acts ch chapter 17 and verse 11, aren't we? And, and the Apostle Paul's talking to us. Uh, and talking to us about the men in Berea. And he says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. And this is even more important when we realize who these words are coming from. The apostle Paul, a man uh, with the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, an apostle uh, sent to bring the message to the Gentiles. And, you know, the apostle Paul never says, oh, you know, I'm the apostle Paul and I have the Holy Spirit and you just need to listen to me. He says, no, you go out and you search the scriptures and you make sure that these things that I'm telling you are the truth. And so there's a message for each one of us, brothers and sisters. We need to be washed by the water of the word. We need to open the scriptures. We need to be immersed in this word of God if we want to be in God's plan and purpose. We need to have a relationship with our Father in heaven. Uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, another one uh, that, um, you know, is very important. It says, for whatsoever things uh, were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. So there again, and I, I think it's just like uh, Brother Caleb was saying on Wednesday, is, you know, it's not what we think, it's not what we want to do, but it's the fact that we're being obedient to what God commands us to do and, and to open our scripture and to search out those words. And so uh, what I thought we would do uh, this evening is, you know, there are several judgments that are brought down on the world in different cities and different um, different peoples. And I would like to look at some of those judgments because in some of those judgments, God has brought down condemnation uh, on the people that lived in those times and in those places, but he's also chosen people that he has saved. And, and so I think this is an important uh, message for us. And two, you know, we think of Matthew, if you go to Matthew 24, and, you know, he really tells us uh, about uh, Noah, doesn't he? So let's just go to Matthew chapter 24, uh, verses 37 uh, through to 39. And so, you know, when we look at scripture, we see how relevant the days of Noah are to us, don't we, brothers and sisters? He says, but as the days of Noah were... 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So if you want to have some understanding about the judgment that is coming down on the earth and what is going to happen, look at the days of Noah. And he goes on to say, for as in the days of Noah, sorry, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. You know, and it's really interesting, you know, you think that he would come out with all these terrible things, and those terrible things we'll see are in Genesis. But here in Matthew, the problem with the world was, is that people were going on with their own lives, and they weren't considering God. They take in God out of their life and were serving themselves. So it's not that marrying or giving in marriage or eating and drinking are wrong, but the world had really taken God out of their lives. And that's the same uh, as the world we live in today. The world we live in today has separated themselves from God. So let's just go back uh, to Genesis. And, you know, we're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 6. And I remember my brother, Dean Bailey. And Dean, I don't know if you were out there or not, but I know you've been going through some hard times and you've had some, some problems with your health. And I hope you are doing much better. I hope you're on the mend. And... Uh, Hopefully I can maybe talk to you afterwards and that you're doing much better. But I remember Dean Bailey saying to me, you know, Paul, if you're ever doing a study, a word study, a lot of times, if you go to the first place that that word is used, you're going to find the best description of what that, that word means. And you're going to have a really good understanding of what that word means. And you're absolutely true. A lot of times, the first place you look up a word is the best place to turn. And of course, I'm thinking of the word grace. So let's go to Genesis chapter six. And we'll start at verse five. And it says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And so we know that the story of Noah, God is going to bring a destruction down upon uh, the earth because man had turned away and had taken God out of their lives. But we see Noah, and here's that word grace, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And it's interesting. I remember a few years ago, we were doing the seminars and one of these scientists had said that when you look at how long these people lived and, and how many children they could have had, that there was quite possibly the same amount of people living in this time of Noah as there are today. Now, you know, that's 7 billion people. Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this. I don't, I don't know whether that's a fact or not. But I just thought it was interesting that God is comparing the days of Noah to the days we live in today. And then this scientist had said there was quite possibly the same amount of people living in the earth. So not going to be dogmatic about it. Please don't. Uh, uh, anyways, so... But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And why, you know, out of all the millions or billions of people living on the earth, why did Noah find grace? And it says, verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And I know somebody told me, that the proper word is not necessarily perfect, but complete. But of course, if God says we need to be complete, uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, what does it mean to be complete? Maybe it means perfect. But anyways, uh, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. 
and Noah walked with God. So Noah knew God. You know, Noah knew God's plan and purpose and, and what God was going to do. He had a relationship and understood God's plan and purpose. And if we go on up to, to verse 22, it goes on, doesn't it? It says, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. So why did God save Noah? Well, God saved Noah because he had a relationship with God. He loved God. He obeyed God, uh, did everything that God commanded him to do, even to the point of building this giant ship, this giant ark um, that took him over 120 years to build. So he... Uh, and then it goes on, and the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So again, we see that Noah was saved because he was a just man. He was a righteous man. He did what God asked him to do, and he had a uh, relationship with his father in heaven. And I just want to look at one other verse um, that I think is important when we're talking about grace. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second, uh, Second Corinthians, I know it's here somewhere. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. Look what it says. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So God gives us grace. He gives us grace now. Why does he do that? So we can give it to others. God gives us abundantly that grace so that we can bestow it on others. Um, and I couldn't help but thinking of, of, of the parable of the talents. You know, the, the king is going away on a long journey and he gives one of his men five talents and he gives one of his men two talents and one of his men one talent. And he goes away on a long journey. And when he comes back, the one whom he had given five talents gave him back more than he had given him. So God had given this man five talents and this man gives back 10. And the one who had been given two talents gives back four. And of course, the one who was given one talent and put it in a Tupperware container and buried it in the ground and returned it in the exact same shape as he had been given it, was cast into outer darkness, wasn't he? And there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, God gives us grace. He pours that grace down upon us. And we are commanded to give that same grace that God has given us to others. It's really amazing how God works, isn't it? And of course, we can't help thinking of Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 35, where the Lord Jesus Christ says, it is more blessed to give than receive. And so, you know, we receive this grace from God, but our blessings come from sharing that grace with others. I wanted to sort of talk about mercy too, because again, mercy is something that God pours out upon us, doesn't he? Let's just go to Genesis chapter 19, and we see this mercy um, that God pours out on Lot. So we're going to come to Genesis 19, and we're going to come... Oh, sorry, I'm in, the wrong, I'm in Exodus, that's why I can't find it. So Genesis 19. Uh, 
Uh, and Genesis 19, verses 16 and 17. And, and we know the story of Lot, don't we? He's gone down into Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's living down there in the city. And uh, the angels come there, and they wanted to stay out in, the, out in the city, but Lot convinces them to come into his house. And uh, the angels have to strike the town people with blindness to save Lot's family. And in the morning, uh, they're trying to rush Lot and his family out of, of Sodom and Gomorrah because God is bringing this judgment down upon the city of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so here we see another judgment. And let's look at what it says. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of the two daughters and the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And so there we see that Lot, God is being merciful with uh, Lot and escorts him out of the city and saves his life. But there's a little more to this story, isn't there? So if we come to 2 Peter, if we come to 2 Peter, there's a little bit more on this story that adds to it. So we're going to come to 2 Peter 2, uh, and we're looking at uh, 2 Peter 2, and we're looking at verses seven and eight. And look what it says. And they delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And you sort of wonder, if Lot was vexed with the, you know, with the filthiness that was going on in the city, but he was a righteous man, what was he doing in the city? And you just wonder if he wasn't preaching the kingdom of God, um, you know, trying to bring the people to God. He was being merciful in um, trying to turn these people to God. And so we see God's mercy is, is turned on Lot because of his mercifulness. So 2 Peter 2 verse 7 or 8. And I'm going to read it again. And deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, there's only one reason a righteous man would be living among the wicked, and that's to convert them to save them. Uh, and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And he goes on, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So again, here we have this example, don't we, of the merciful uh, um, God being merciful on this man and saving him because of his righteousness and because he is saving others. Let's go to Hebrews uh, chapter 3. And again, we're looking at the nation of Israel, aren't we? Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, and uh, starting at verse 8, and we're, we have a warning, don't we? Uh, you know, this nation of Israel is pointed out to us not so we can find fault or, or look at them and say, wow, they sure failed at that or they sure blew it, but it, it's so that we can look to their example and not fall to the same mistakes that they fell to. That's the reason it's put there. We, we need to learn from their mistakes and not make the same ones. So Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. And so, you know, there's a message for us, isn't there, that we need to know God. 
We need to know God's ways. We need to be washed by the water of the word. We need to open this Bible and we need to read it and understand it and apply it to our own lives that we too may be saved. Um, Hebrews 4 and verse 11, it says, For he that is entered into his rest, he has also ceased from his own work. So, you know, that's what we're commanded to do. If we want to be in God's kingdom, we have to cease from doing our works and doing the works that God commands us to do. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So, you know, we have to believe God, we have to search out the scriptures, and we have to be obedient to the commandments we are given. Numbers uh, 32 and 12, and again, we see these righteous men who uh, when the rest of the nation, other than the Levites, perished in the wilderness, we see Numbers 32 and 12, and it says, uh, we'll start at verse 11, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upwards shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. And so we see how important it is, don't we, brothers and sisters, that we open our word, that we search the scriptures, and that we are washed by the water of the word. Um, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. So we come to Hebrews chapter 11, and I just wanted to talk about faith for a few minutes, uh, because I think it's also very important. Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 1, we're all familiar with, with faith and how important it is in the life of a man serving God. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. And so, you know, we all believe in God. All of us who are here believe in God, but we've never seen him. But it's not a blind faith, is it, brothers and sisters? Because, you know, every time we look at this world that he has created, every time we look at the bodies that God has given us. Every time we look at the stars in the heavens, every time we open the word of God and see the wonders that are found therein, we see an evidence of God, don't we? Now, many in the world don't see that evidence of God, but we're here because we do. We see that evidence of God at work all around us. And then we go, of course, to verse six, and it says, but without faith, is, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So again, some other good information for each one of us. We have to believe in God, but we also have to diligently seek him out. We have to find out what he asks us to do, and we have to be obedient to those commands. Now, let's just go to James for a minute. And I want to look at uh, James chapter 2. And, you know, I can't help but looking at Abraham, because, of course, Abraham was one of the patriarchs. Um, you know, we are promised the same promises that are made to Abraham. And if we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we become heirs to those promises that were made to our father Abraham. Um, so 
when we come to James chapter 2 and verse 21, look what it says. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? So we know that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was counted as righteousness, even though he had no acts of righteousness. And I, I think Brother Steve not too long ago was talking about this you know god can look down upon us and he can count us as righteous when we've done nothing we've done nothing righteous and i i, I think that's true you know when we come out of the waters of baptism we have no works of righteousness because before we were baptized we hadn't made a commitment to god and so we weren't doing it for, for God. We weren't living for God. We were living for ourselves. But when we make that commitment, we come out of the waters of baptism and God counts us as righteous without works. But look what it says about Abraham. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. So until we have works, we're only saved, we're imputed, right? Or counted as righteous until we have works. And then in verse 23, it says, the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness because now we've done something that shows that we do have faith uh, because of what we have done. And so when we come to Hebrews 11, we find all those faithful men and women of old who believed God, they had faith, they trusted in God, but they are made perfect by their works, right? Their works has perfected. Verse 20, 22, seest thou how faith wrought with works and by works was faith made perfect. So when we come to Hebrews chapter 11, all these men and women had faith and showed that faith by the things that they did. Noah built an ark. Abraham offered Isaac. Sarah was able to conceive because she trusted in God. All these men and women had perfect faith because they were followed by works. And I think that's an important lesson for each one of us that we have to understand. Now, I'd like you to turn with me to John chapter 13. And I, I just want to look at John chapter 13 because I think there's quite a bit of information here for us in John chapter 13. So here we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is preparing for the sacrifice that he's going to make. He is going to be crucified. He's going to be nailed to the cross. And then he is going to ascend up into heaven. And in John chapter 13, he is preparing his disciples, isn't he? He's setting the example for his disciples and preparing them to go out and take the good news of the gospel to the people all around the world. He says, go out into the world. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be damned. And so that's really what this chapter is all about, isn't it? It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ preparing his disciples to go out into the world. In fact, if you go right over to verse 15, he says, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So we see these things that the Lord Jesus Christ is setting before them is an example of what they need to do. Uh, when you look at chapter or chapter 13, uh, and we're looking at verse 1, and it's very interesting. He says that his hour was come that he should depart out of the world unto the Father. And this really gives me a lot of strength, brothers and sisters, because 
you know, th throughout scripture, five times, it says that his time had not yet come. You know, they were going to throw him down a mountain. They were going to put him to death. They were, they wanted to arrest him and, and take him out and put him to death. The soldiers were sent to arrest him. And it says that his time was not yet come. So we know that even with the, the death, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, God was in control of those things, that it was going to happen when God was ready for it to happen. It was going to happen when the Lord Jesus Christ was at his strongest, when he was the most able to overcome. Um, and we know the Lord Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 5, it says he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So those things that were happening in his life were to make him stronger uh, and to make him obedient. And, and it's the same way for us. God is working in our lives and nothing is going to happen if we are truly trying to serve God. Remember those words, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. In fact, if you go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, First Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, verse 13, look what he says. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So, you know, we too, just like the Lord Jesus Christ, are going to go through troubles and trials and, and um, chastening. But God is there working in our lives, isn't he? And he's making a way. He's helping us to overcome. He wants us to succeed. So if we're doing our best to serve our Father in heaven, he uh, is going to help us in that endeavor. Um, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them until the end. And I, I think that's important too. You know, we think of John chapter 1 and verse 12. Let's go to John chapter 1 and verse 12. And, and uh, it says, John chapter 1 and verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so that is what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for each one of us, hasn't he? He has given us the power to become sons of God, to um, follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ and to follow that example that has been set before us. Uh, let's go to Romans 8 and verse 14. Okay, look what it says. I'm going to start at verse 13. It says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ has given us that spirit, hasn't he? He's given us that spirit that we may follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we may follow his example. And, you know, we come right over to, to John chapter 6, and I, I really love John, but look what he says in John chapter 6 and verse 63. He tells us what that spirit is. He says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. And what is quickeneth means? It means to give us life. It is the spirit that gives us life. The flesh profiteth nothing. 
the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And where did the Lord Jesus Christ get those words that he passes on to us, brothers and sisters, from his father, his father in heaven. And so he gives those words to us. And we open the scriptures. We're washed by the water of the word. And look at Peter. Like Simon Peter really has the idea, doesn't he? He says, um, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye go away also? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And so there we have, don't we? We have the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come down to uh, verse three, and it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and was going or went to God. And, and I can't help but thinking uh, of the credentials of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Um, the credentials that the Lord Jesus Christ gives or that were given um, in Hebrews chapter 1. Look what it says. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all thing by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty of God. And so there's God manifestation in the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't there? There's the example. And we remember the Lord Jesus Christ saying to his disciples, you know, they said, show us the father and it will suffice. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, have I been with you so long? And you do not know that if you've seen me, you have seen the father. And of course we know that is because um, the Lord Jesus Christ manifested God in his life, right? His, the, 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 his thoughts were from God. The words that he spoke were from God. The things that he did was from God. And if we just flip over, uh, flip over the page to John chapter 14, um, and we see this, uh, what I was talking about before. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 9, he says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, then show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. And then if we skip over, just over to verse 20, it says, at that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself unto him. So again, you know, we see this idea of God manifestation, that we are commanded to manifest uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven. Um, verse 4, uh, it says, He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And it's interesting that uh, when you think of girded, well, it means to prepare oneself for something difficult or challenging. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is setting this example for us, isn't he? Because he says, uh, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. We're commanded to gird ourselves, and we're going to see that. We're commanded to prepare ourselves, be ready for the return of Christ. And 
you know, as you go through scripture, I think of Exodus 12 and 11, uh, the Passover, and they were commanded to gird themselves, to be ready to come out of Egypt, to go to the promised land. And, you know, an example set for us, we must be girded and ready to come out of Egypt and to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Leviticus 8 and 13, um, Aaron and his sons were commanded to gird themselves and prepare to do the work of God. Psalms uh, 18 and 39, David was also commanded to gird himself and prepare for battle and to do the work of his father in heaven. Uh, and if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 12 and verse 35, Let's just go to Luke chapter 12 and 35. Look what he says. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Uh, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning bright. And you know, that's a commandment, isn't it? We're commanded to be, to be ready to meet the Lord and we're commanded to have our alert our lights burning brightly you know to go out and to tell those of the good news of the coming kingdom of God so again an example for each one of us to have our lights burning brightly to gird ourselves and be ready for the work that is put before us uh, and then we come to verse five. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And so we see, don't we? We see the Lord Jesus Christ. And in many places, it uses the word servant. But if you look up that word servant, it's not really servant. It's actually a bond slave, isn't it, brothers and sisters? The Lord Jesus Christ has made himself a bond slave. He's there washing the feet of his disciples. And he commands us to do the same, doesn't he, brothers and sisters? He's not washing Peter's feet because Peter needs his feet washed. He's washing Peter's feet because Peter needs to realize that this is what he has to do. And this is what each one of us have to do. We have to be ready to wash the feet of one another. So let's go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Uh, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 7. Philippians 2. So, look what he says. Philippians 2. We're going to start in verse 5. Here again, we have that, that idea of God manifestation, don't we? He says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And if you look up that servant, it's actually a bond slave and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross and of course we are commanded to do the same aren't we we're commanded take up your cross and follow me so again we have that idea of a bond slave uh, and you know when the lord jesus christ says i have given you an example that you should do as i have done to you we see that the apostles took them, took the Lord Jesus Christ at his word, don't we? Because in Romans chapter one and verse one, the apostle Paul says, the apostle Paul, a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians four and 12, Epaphras says, a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus one, again, Paul, a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
James 1 and 1. James says, uh, James, a bond slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jude 1 and 1, Jude, a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have a command for each one of us. Let's go to Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Romans 6. And look what he says in verse 16. He says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So uh, as we come out of the waters of baptism, we become a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we, brothers and sisters? He is our master, and we are commanded to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so let's... Uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 7 to 11. Second Corinthians 4. And uh, 2 Corinthians 4, and let's start at verse 5. And it says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. So again, that idea of a bond slave was to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ and follow uh, after his example, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So again, we have this idea of manifesting the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore our father in these earthen vessels. We have this this duty to do this now, that the excellency of the power of God, that the power may be of God and not of us. And of course, it's God working in us, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Remember uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, when he saw a rich man and said, it is harder for a rich man to go uh, it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And, and, and the reaction of the disciples was, who then can be saved? And of course, God said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are, are possible. And I remember my mother always said, you know, we can't do this without God. But God will not do it without us. So yes, God needs to, we need God working in our lives. But if we want him there, he will be there to work with us. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. So there's God manifestation, right? Manifesting God in our lives today. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. And so there's um, what God commands us to do, doesn't he? To manifest God in our lives today. 
in these mortal bodies that we live in. And so I'm not sure, I guess I'm pretty well running out of time. Um, so then we come, Simon Peter, verse nine, saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus saith unto him, he who is washed need not save to wash his feet. And uh, let's just go to Galatians. I'm going to really wrap this up uh, really quick. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians, uh, of course, Galatians chapter 3, uh, and we're looking at 26 to 29. It said, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So again, there's the idea of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and manifesting him in our lives today. And so uh, Acts 26 and 20. Acts 26 and 20. And here's a commandment again of what is necessary if we want to be in God's kingdom to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So, you know, we've, we've gone through the waters of baptism. We've been forgiven of our sins. And now it's time for us, brothers and sisters, to manifest um, the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ and try to be like him. And I just... Uh, um, want to close with Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. No, no, that wasn't it. Sorry, wrong verse. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, let's go to First Timothy. And we're going to look at 5 and 10. So 1 Timothy verse chapter 5 and verse 10. And I know this verse is written to the widows, but, uh, you know, we are commanded to bring forth works, meet for repentance. And we, we have been obedient in the uh, washing through the waters of baptism. We have been cleansed by God's grace. Uh, and look what he tells us to do. Um, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years of old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children. And of course, we are commanded, aren't we, to bring up our children. In fact, Abraham was told that um, God loved Abraham because he knew that Abraham would command his children to follow in his footsteps. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet. And there's that idea of this washing the saints' feet, brothers and sisters. They were commanded, the apostles were commanded to wash one another's feet. It's doing good works, meet for repentance. If she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So if we want salvation, brothers and sisters, what do we need to do? We need to be washed by the water of God's word. We need to read God's word and we need to manifest in our, God, in our lives each and every day our Father in heaven, to the best of our abilities. Thank you very much.